Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this event. I'm very delighted and honored to chair this session. So Mike and I have known each other about more than 20 years. We first met when he was in IDA, some kind of sister organization of KIDA. Actually, KIDA was established following the IDA model. So uh, since then, we have known each other and worked together on various occasions. I'm very much delighted. But anyhow, actually, when I was asked to chair this session, okay, I said, without any thinking, okay. When I looked at it, this, his book, this is really <laughs> thick one. It's about 800 pages. When we complete the translation, it turns out 1,040 pages. So I was really surprised and actually scared to do this translation. And I read some part of it, but actually I'm very much delighted. As I learned a lot because actually history of the American grand strategy toward the Asia Pacific region. So we have a lot to talk, and also as you have draw some lessons from there. Uh, uh, so it is our great pleasure to do the translation, and also because of Dr. Hamek chose your book to do the translation. Also, this is maybe kinds of must-have item for all political scientists or regional specialists to do the analysis on American strategy toward the Asia Pacific region has a lot of implication for that. And also, first, actually, I was um, uh, actually puzzled why you decided to write such a thick book. What <laughs> motivates you to write? <laughs> so please, tell me about why you decided to do so. Well, I, I thought I would become famous, and there would be a movie, and I could <laughs> star in the movie. And, <clears throat> um, and it turns out Hollywood doesn't like American strategic diplomatic history that much. Uh, no, the, um, the idea came to me after I'd been out of the NSC, I worked in the National Security Council staff in the Bush administration for five years. Um, and when I came out, I was quite certain that I wanted to write something that um, uh, built on my experience, but I looked at my time on the NSC staff, now that I was a scholar again, as a kind of demand signal. What, what are the things that I wish I had known or that I wish I had read before I started working on the NSC staff? And a lot of the big questions um, in political science were not that interesting to me. Um, someone has observed that every political scientist who went into the Bush administration, me, Victor Chaw, um, Megan O'Sullivan, we all came out and wrote histories. Mm. <laughs> um, and um, the thing that I wanted to know, the, the thing I wish I had known um, and had studied uh, and had read was um, the roots of our strategy towards mm. Asia. So mm -hmm. um, I worked on the national security strategy. I wrote the ASA section in 2002. Um, I wrote um, internal um, national security presidential directives, which were our classified strategies on North Korea and Asia. In the Pentagon, uh, earlier I'd worked on um, the um, e EASER reports on strategy. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I'd written all this, and it, it, it occurred to me um, we were making all of these assertions and so on and so forth. Where did these principles, where did these strategies come from? And why do we keep making the same mistakes over and over again? And so I decided that um, the book I really wanted to read was the book I should write, and that was a history of the evolution of American strategic thought towards uh, the Asia-Pacific region. <clears throat> I was teaching this at Georgetown. There are some excellent bilateral histories um, Lefebvre's book, The Clash, about U.S.-Japan relations, um, uh, many books on U.S.-China relations, um, U.S.-Korea. Um, there was no comprehensive look at the evolution of American uh, approaches to the Asia mm. region as a whole. Since 1922, basically, a historian at, um, uh, actually a political scientist at Johns Hopkins named Tyler Dennett. Um, I, I, so I decided I would do that. And there were a couple of assumptions that informed this. Um, one was, um, I, I was interested in this because I thought the United States needed a clear understanding of what our grand strategy was going to be towards this region at a time of profound shifts in the balance of power. Mm -hmm. And so the first assumption was that our grand strategy was not going to work if it was European. Mm. That if we took Thucydides or Metternich or Clausewitz or Klaus Castlereagh, um, and we tried to impose that on an American political system, it wouldn't work. Mm. Uh, Kissinger briefly made it work, briefly, in our history. Um, so that was one assumption. The other assumption was that the United States is capable of, at some level, regional strategy. Um, uh, but whatever it is, the regional strategy had to be based on our own roots. So 
I um, initially thought I would write a kind of intellectual history. Where did the idea of forward presence come from, free trade? And that perhaps I would have a little bit of a, uh, an opening chapter with the history um, uh, of American engagement in Asia, but the real strategic debates mm -hmm. and the real story would begin maybe in 1898 after the Spanish-American War, probably, I thought, 1945, maybe 1951, 52, the Korean War. But as I started doing the archival research, um, I found that the issues that we were debating in the Bush administration and then in the Obama administration, um, they were incredibly uh, resonant with the kinds of debates that I found in the letters of Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. or the speeches of John Quincy Adams. Um, uh, and of course, in more uh, uh, recent, relatively recent strategic thinkers like Alfred Thayer Mahan. And so that made it a longer book because the roots of the strategic thinking go back to the beginning of the Republic um, to 1783, mm -hmm. to the midst of the revolution. And also I realized I could write a fairly short intellectual history of American thought towards Asia, but um, that doesn't help you make strategy because not all thoughts are created equal. And there are a lot of studies that are done about American strategic thinking that have different schools of thought, but they're not all created equal. And so I wanted to understand how different concepts evolved, what happened when they clashed with reality, mm -hmm. how they came back. There was an interaction of reality mm -hmm. <laughs> in diplomacy and war and trade and concepts or theories. And that kind of dialectic animates and propels the story um, uh, and um, made it a longer book, but um, I think the story was important and it was fun to research. Okay, actually, so that's why we had to go all the way back to 1783, so actually formation of the debates the foundation of American strategy vis-a-vis -vis toward actually Asia-Pacific region. Actually, your book is divided into four parts, arrival of the United States, second part is the rise of Japan, third part is rise of the Soviet Union, final part is rise of China. So actually, what is the overarching theme crossing all these four periods of American engagement toward the Asia-Pacific region? Um, so the book begins in 1783 um, because that's the first um, archival evidence mm -hmm. <laughs> of some American strategic thought about our position in the Pacific. And 1783 is when Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to uh, Colonel George Rogers Clark, who was on the frontier, which in, when it's rich in those days was you know, somewhere near Tennessee, um, uh, warning him that American uh, agents in London had found out that the British were raising money to send an expedition across Canada mm. to seize control of the Pacific Northwest. And, um, and Jefferson, in this letter to Clark, said, we can't allow that to happen, that our new nation has to have access to the Pacific Northwest. And um, this, of course, was about making sure that the Republic was um, an empire of liberty, as it was called, from coast to coast. But Jefferson knew very well about the Pacific. Mm. Um, and so did George Washington. So did Roger, uh, uh, Robert Morris, the, the, the banker for the revolution. A, a lot of what they knew was from an American named John Ledyard, who um, was a student at, um, Dartmouth, and uh, for spring break, his sophomore year, um, he chopped down a tree, um, carved it into a canoe, canoed down the Connecticut River, um, and joined the Royal Navy. And he, he became a Royal Marine on Captain Cook's flagship. So he traveled to the Pacific Northwest, and he saw uh, sea otter pelts being taken and then sold, the, the furs being sold in, in Guangzhou and Canton mm -hmm. to the Hong merchants for huge profits. And he saw all of this this trade and ecosystem of the Pacific and, and, and went around to the Founding Fathers and said, we've got to go there. Um, so the, the meta theme for the book is from 1783, from the beginning, um, American strategic thinkers have looked at the Pacific and have um, been determined that we're not closed out, that, that the Pacific remains a conduit for American uh, security, trade, and, and values to go west to go that way and not for threats to come this way and close us off. And that's a pretty consistent theme and it goes back pretty far. Uh, John Quincy Adams I talk about a lot threatened to go to war with Britain and Russia to 
protect the Pacific Northwest in the 1820s, even though we could not have fought that war. We couldn't even get there. Um, John Tyler, as president in 1841, extended the Monroe Doctrine to Hawaii. Um, and, and, you know, and every decade or two or three, there's a major American move to declare to the other powers, don't try to block us out of Asia, even at the risk of war. And it goes back quite far um, and has been generally quite successful. Um, in the post-war period, it included the creation of our alliance network. But even in the post-Cold War era, um, I worked in the Clinton uh, Defense Department uh, on what was called the Nye Initiative to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance to maintain a balance of power. Patrick was very involved at the time. I then went into the Bush administration. We built on that and then extended that to India. And I think the Obama administration's pivot to Asia is really a story about re-engaging in Southeast Asia. So the meta theme is the United States has actually been a balance of power country in this region for a long time. Uh, but uh, uh, we're American. Um, and um, as Richard Betts at Columbia says, our strategy, he's talking generally, not just Asia, but our strategy is often uh, effective, uh, but it's not efficient. It's very mm. inefficient. Mm. And so um, throughout this history, there are these tensions, these, these inefficiencies, these idiosyncrasies, these mistakes that American uh, strategic leaders make again and again and again. Mm. And I thought it was very important for us to learn that because our margin for error is shrinking. I can touch on it briefly if it's okay. okay. I mean, the, the, there are five basically, but the first is while we've had this strategic approach at key points in our history to prevent hegemons mm -hmm. from closing yeah. us out, mm -hmm. as you said, first the British, then the Japanese, uh, then the Soviets, um, but others in between, the Germans, for example. Uh, while we've had that, um, we are, have historically been a Europe first country. Yeah, I mean, right. Asia has yeah. been a secondary or tertiary theater. Um, and mistakes flow from that. You know, Woodrow Wilson in World War I, in order to focus on winning in Europe, keeping the British, uh, it, it, what, what Colonel Edward House called the gyroscope of international affairs from falling, because Europe was most important to us at that point. Uh, Japan was allied with Britain, and, and, and Wilson allowed the Japanese to run amok in Asia, mm -hmm. in, including the 21 demands in 1915. Um, and we do that again and again. T today, and for the past eight years or so, in public opinion polls, over half of Americans say Asia is the most important region. Mm -hmm. Um, but the demands on us as a global power from the Middle East and now Russia are enormous. So one problem we've had is that Asia has been a secondary tertiary theater. I don't think Americans think that way anymore, but we're still a global power. And the, the takeaway is we have got to have our strategic concept right for Asia. It's, we're not going to be able to um, pivot to Asia and ignore the Middle East or Europe. We've got to understand what our strategic interests are and, be, and apply them wisely. Um, another uh, tension we've had is that when you look at this region um, from the United States as a maritime power, uh, Japan is a natural partner. Um, but if you look at the history of Asia, China has been the center of Asia. So there's been this tension throughout our history um, between uh, those who will sometimes argue that China is the center of our strategy and those who argue Japan and the maritime. And I focus on 1853 when Humphrey Marshall, a Kentucky cavalryman and the ambassador or commissioner in China, um, wrote back during the Taiping Rebellion. He said I, he wanted to take the small American fleet and use it to show the flag um, and to do what later became known as the open door, to, mm. to open China and to show the British and the Russians, we're, we're with a whole China. Um, but that fleet belonged to another man, a Commodore named Matthew Perry, mm. who took it, of course, to Japan. Uh, to open Japan, and Perry came back to the U.S. and gave a series of speeches about how, in the future, the U.S., Japan, and Britain would safeguard the seas as maritime powers. Um, that Japan-China continental maritime dichotomy, we, we go back and forth. Um, and it's still very much part of the debate today. Um, and frankly, the Trump administration's free and open Indo-Pacific concept is a vote for the maritime. maritime. But Elements of the Obama administration embraced Xi Jinping's vision of a new model of great power relations, which is very much a Sinocentric vision. So we have to sort that out. Um, and related to that, where's our defensive line? Mm. Um, we, the maritime instinct has normally prevailed, so you had things like uh, uh, Dean Acheson's famous line in January 1950, mm -hmm. after the fall of China to communism, saying our defensive line in Asia is here. And of course, Korea was on the wrong side 
and Kim Il-sung invaded. And then we said, no, 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 okay, it's here at what became the DMZ. But we're not going into Indochina. Mm. But then we ended up in Indochina. And then Nixon in 69 said, no, no, we're out of Southeast Asia. So um, where we draw that line where we're willing to risk or fight wars has been a constant challenge. And um, Korea and U.S.-Korea relations have fallen victim to that tension. Because mm. Korea is neither maritime nor continental, it's both. Um, and, you know, so many strategic thinkers in American history said, we don't want to be in Korea. I don't think that's the case today. I think support, I know support for the alliance is the highest it's been in a long time in the United States. But if you look at the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, how does Korea fit? Mm. So we struggle with that one. Um, trade, uh, we, um, uh, the first uh, ship on the cover of the English version was the Empress of China, 1784, huge profit selling ginseng from Pennsylvania and West Virginia, Virginia, to the Hong merchants. But of course, we were for a high tariff. Uh, we were for trade, but we had a high tariff. Um, Alfred Thayer Mahan, the naval strategist, interestingly, um, argued that that was a strategic mistake, mm. and that the that tariffs were like um, gun gunboats, ironclads, like the Monitor and the Merrimack in the Civil War. That global powers needed free trade, um, and um, we didn't learn that. He argued that in 1890. Uh, we didn't learn that. We had Smoot Hawley protectionism in the 30s. And then after the war, we learned the lesson the hard way and had the Bretton Woods system. But again, this tension is very evident in the TPP debate uh, today. And then the last tension is our values. We, um, uh, you know, grand strategists often will argue that interests and real politics are different from values. But that's not the way Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, um, Mahan, or many of the most influential and successful strategists in Asia thought about it. They looked at Asia, and they saw a region, as we were emerging as a power, where the Qing dynasty was collapsing, and the nation state was rising, and the definition of the nation state was contested uh, with the British Empire, with the Japanese, with the Soviet Empire. <clears throat> um, but we've struggled uh, with that. Um, should we stand for self-determination, or should we stand for human rights and democracy. Thomas Paine, mm. you know, exporting our revolution or anti-colonialism, these two pieces of the DNA in our revolution. It's a very relevant question again today because of China's Belt and Road. Mm -hmm. And I mean, part of our answer to China's Belt and Road, I think, should be uh, support for good governance and a free press. Um, this is a tension, but it's a critical part of our strategy. So we've, we've, we've tripped over these with remarkable uh, rep repetition, mm -hmm. and um, one of the takeaways has got to be, we'll compete. I think the Chinese edition of this book is coming out soon. I, I hope a lot of Chinese read it. The um, United States will compete. But our margin for error is smaller than it has been, and mm -hmm. we can't afford to keep making these um, mistakes and getting stuck in these uh, inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. Actually, it seems to me that when I read your book, it seems to me the U.S. has a strategy, has had a strategy, but in terms of the implementation, maybe sometime it's been hijacked by events in other places and the lack of consistency and lack of residential power. So for that purpose, I think that I'd like to ask you some, what should be done by the United States to take care of, uh, to, to actually to realize this grand strategy in coming years? Well, um, we have to learn from our history. It's why I wrote this book. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, um, we don't have the, we don't have the, the, the margin for error with China's growing power to, f to you know, within a few years, embrace the new model of great power relations and then embrace the free and open Indo-Pacific. We can't, we're not organizing our uh, strategic concepts well at all. We, we have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy has merit because I think the, the maritime approach focused on democratic allies is the right starting point for a successful um, China strategy. Um, but one of the other things we have to understand is how important Korea is. Um, the, the, Korea has been a blind spot for, for much of American mm. strategic history. Um, American strategic thinkers were very smart on Japan and very smart on China, but, the, the, but Korea didn't fit their conception. And uh, I think right now, um, Korea and the Korean Peninsula is the most important uh, focus of competition. Mm. And if we can't get this right, 
um, we won't be able to manage the larger challenges uh, uh, associated with the rise of China. And the U.S. Korea alliance is absolutely critical to that. We have to understand that. Trade is critical, and we're not learning that lesson. Um, but the bottom line of all of these is um, we need to be using all instruments of our national power. And we need to understand, Hugh White and the panel yesterday had an interesting discussion, and people often debate the rise of China in terms of American primacy. Well, much of American history is a, is, is a history of America successfully protecting its interests, and only for a very brief period did we actually have primacy. Most of our history of engagement in this region, the region was multipolar. There were multiple powers. We need to think about Asia as it's emerging, the distribution of power, um, and understand how important Korea is, India, Indonesia, of course, Japan, um, and uh, be on the right side of history um, by standing up for the rights of all of these very important powers to determine their future. Being the primary, the primacy itself is not an objective we necessarily, it, I would argue it's an ends to a means, mm. excuse me, a means to an end. Um, we need to think about the emerging power structure and how we can play that to our advantage, which statesmen in our history have done uh, before we were preeminent. Mm. So that's a recommendation you can make to your, to your American fellow, but what kinds of recommendations you can make to, to your, your regional allies and friends in implementing your grand strategy toward the Asia-Pacific region? Well, um, the first is learn from American history. Um, it's a mistake to think that the United States is instinctively isolationist towards the Pacific. It's not been true since 1783. The, um, the scholar and journalist Walter Lippmann wrote in the late 30s that um, America has isolationist instincts towards Europe, but it, he said uh, America has never been isolationist in the Pacific. And in, and in 1940, after the fall of France, there was a poll done by Gallup that was very famous because Americans were still hesitant to get involved in the war in Europe. But in that same poll, there was a question saying, should the U.S. pressure Japan on the China question even if that means risking war with Japan. Mm -hmm. And something like 70% of Americans said yes. So one really important lesson is um, do not equate isolationism with uh, the Pacific. It's historically been more about Europe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other lesson is that US will compete. Um, and for allies, um, I think the important thing is to, you know, this continental versus maritime, Japan versus China, it puts Japan and Korea on different sides sometimes. I think it's important for allies to also look at what's at stake and the distribution of power and understand their common interests in shaping American strategy. Because one thing the book shows is how often American strategy is shaped by allies. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter's pledge to withdraw yes. from Korea was ultimately stopped by Japan, mm -hmm. for example. Um, uh, I think um, Barack Obama's decision to go into TPP uh, and move ahead with course was shaped by Im Young Bak. So yeah. allies can shape American strategy. So more active engagement with the Americans about this rather long-term strategy and desirable architecture or the norms, kinds right. of things, very necessary for allies to do so. Thank you. And it seems to me we have about 20 minutes, so I can open up the questions from the floor. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. We will bring the mic to you. Richard White. Sorry, you left hanging that interesting point about Jimmy Carter's approach to Korea being reversed by Japan. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Cause, you know, the lore is he, the military and others just pressured him in the U.S. to reverse. I didn't know there was a, a foreign input into that, aside from, you know, Korean objections. Um, so it's interesting. I interviewed um, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Harold Brown. I mean, interviewed a lot of people, um, Morta Bromwitz. Um, uh, nobody would claim credit for Jimmy Carter's pledge to withdraw from the Korean Peninsula. Um, everyone blamed Richard Holbrook, but he had passed away before I could interview him. <laughs> um, as Big Brzezinski actually said, he was pretty sure it was Carter himself, and it had a lot to do with um, Carter's view of the Vietnam War, and he equated um, uh, Pak Chung-hee with Prime Minister Chu of South Vietnam and thought it was the same story all over again, an undemocratic ally pulling us into a war on the peninsula, that we, on the continent that we don't want. In any case, um, what blunted it was that um, Harold Brown agreed that it would be important to consult with allies. And Carter expected that Korea would say, don't do it. But the, but the Japanese were quite adamant, quietly. And um, Koji Murata, a Japanese scholar, has written a quite detailed 
history of the interactions using Japanese and American archives. Um, it wasn't the only factor, but it was an important factor in blunting it. What ultimately got Carter to turn it around was, um, this is why you got to love the Pentagon, new estimates on the North Korean threat <laughs> uh, to buy more time. But, but Japan's role was critical in blunting the momentum early on. Okay. Gentleman in the third row, yes. Mr. Green, in your analysis of the U.S. foreign policy formulation toward Asia, when did you first see the uh, real interest of, in the part of U.S. strategist, the importance of Korea as versus as a part of China or part of Japan or whatever? And I'd like to tag on uh, one more question to that. The Korea and Japan has now a very silly issue talking about this Dokdo Island, which according to the Cairo arrangement, Cairo announcement between Roosevelt, Churchill, and uh, <coughs> Chiang Kai-shek, Japan had relinquished it, and through the San Francisco uh, Treaty formulation, through the fifth, I understand, the draft, Dr. was part of Korea to be relinquished by Japan, and only because Seaboard, whose wife was Japanese, insisted on changing it, and it got erased out of it. So it, they just left it uh, ambiguous, and that is now the issue. So I'd like to see when real interest in U.S. toward Korea has started. Okay. So the, 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 the very first trading ship, the Empress of China, went to what's now Guangzhou to Canton, and they only cared about trade with China, um, which the colonists knew about. If you've ever been to Colonial Williamsburg, um, I took a group of Chinese scholars there, and there's a Thomas Jefferson reenactor who, uh, in one of the inns, will point to Chinese, China to uh, porcelain and say uh, China is an advanced civilized nation. Uh, Korea didn't enter very much into the thinking. Um, the first strategic proposal on Korea came in the 1850s after um, Britain had secured um, Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, the US Navy and the State Department diplomats in the Pacific, in the, in the Western Pacific, argued the United States also needed its own island, its own outpost. Um, and so Peter Parker was this Yale grad, um, was the, uh, spoke fluent Mandarin, was a missionary, and he proposed back to Washington that we would um, give Korea to France. <laughs> France should get Korea, uh, Britain would get Hong Kong and Singapore, and the U.S. would get either, either the Ryukyus or the Bonin Islands or maybe Formosa was his first choice because the thinking was we're, an, we're a Navy maritime nation state, we don't want to be on the continent. Um, Mahan called Korea and Manchuria a hornet's nest. Um, so the early thinking was not good. Shufelt opened up Korea, of course. Um, and even um, Shufelt had a hard time figuring out where Korea fit. He went to the Chinese and the Japanese and they played games with him. And a lot of Korean historians criticize uh, the Taft-Katsura agreement. How could the United States reach this agreement um, under Secretary of War Taft? with uh, the Japanese where we, they would leave us alone in the Philippines and we would leave them alone in Korea. Um, uh, but at the time, the United States didn't think of Korea as an independent country and it didn't think of the continent as a place where we wanted to be entrapped. Um, and so it's been a, something of a, of a blind spot for, for some time throughout our history. Interesting, interestingly, one of the first really thoughtful pieces I found on the importance of the Korean Peninsula um, was by a graduate student who wrote a thesis in the uh, 1920s at the University of Montana named Mike Mansfield on the history of Korea and U.S. engagement in Korea. And it's an incredibly sophisticated strategic history of American interests in Korea, which Mansfield never published, but of course he became one of the most important figures in the U.S. Congress on U.S.-Asia relations. And he understood Korea very well, and there have been people like that throughout our history who have been absolutely indispensable. Okay. Gentlemen, Daniel Fried, then you. Um, my congratulations. Um, I want to tease out a little bit this maritime versus continental uh, option. Based on this morning's discussion of China, um, mm -hmm. the underlying trade tensions, and the Trump administration, which way do you see us going at present? 
Because if I had to guess, I would say the maritime route, which would mean Japan, Korea, um, Indonesia, the, the ASEAN countries, uh, driven by uh, the rise of Chinese power. And I was struck by um, Walter Russell Mead's comparison with Kaiser Wilhelm II, because you know, that struck me also. You know, the rising power that gets impatient when it doesn't have to be. But I wanted to tease that out a little bit, trying to look ahead into the fog. So I think the, the, the trajectory of the administration is clearly towards the, the maritime. And the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy <coughs> was um, literally lifted from the Japanese foreign ministry, uh, the head of policy planning, a classmate of mine from SAIS actually named Suzuki. Although I teased him and I said, you stole it from Alfred Thayer Mahan, and he stole it from Matthew Perry. <coughs> um, but, but literally, the policy planning in the US in preparation for Tillerson's first trip to India where they had to start articulating a strategy, they had nothing. Um, they had policy planning talks and, and Brian Hook and the US side said, this is, can we use this? And the Japanese who had been spending years fighting against the Chinese proposal for a new model of great power relations, which was Xi Jinping's offer to avoid war to the Obama administration. And President Obama, to his credit, never, never went for it. But Vice President Biden um, at a speech at Georgetown, uh, Susan Rice, um, John Kerry, all welcomed this, you know, positive vision for U.S.-China relations without reading the fine print, which said the new model of great powers involves the great powers of the U.S. and China, maybe Russia, um, Japan, India, Korea, these are not great powers. Um, so Japan had been fighting that. They sent vice ministers and foreign ministers to try to get the Obama administration not to, not to take it. So it was a repudiation of that, an embrace of this uh, Japanese idea. Um, and then the, the one manifestation of the free and open Indo-Pacific is the establishment of re-establishment after a 10-year hiatus of the Quad of the US, Japan, India, Australia. Um, I don't know what noun to attach to those four proper nouns, mechanism, dialogue. Um, so that's the direction. However, um, it's not clear where, I don't think Donald Trump thinks in any of these terms. And uh, he's famously transactional. Um, drawn to people like Putin and Xi Jinping. Um, and so um, it's, it's not at all clear, frankly, that Donald Trump has read the National Security Strategy, which also has this concept, or the Free and Open Indo-Pacific. So I think the drivers are people like um, Brian Hook at Policy Planning, um, Mattis. Um, uh, if you think about it, Mattis, Kelly, um, Dunford, they're all Marines, Maritime Service. Uh, it, it, it makes some sense. Uh, where's the president? Depends on what day of the week it is. I mean, he views each transaction on its own merits. Gentlemen. Yeah, Mike, it's really happy to see the book. Uh, and uh, I got a copy ready before coming to Seoul, but I have not yet read carefully. Uh, my question, uh, if you look at the current uh, trade war between uh, Donald Trump with uh, China, some people make an analogy of early Japan bashing, the trade friction with Japan. Uh, so how do you compare the two cases? And uh, some people argue saying it doesn't matter or it's less important of ideology, rather uh, national interest it will be. Uh, and also one other argument is that it really depends how you perceive whether you are a challenger to the U.S. dominance in U.S., uh, I mean, Asia Pacific. So how do you compare these two cases? Yeah. It's an interesting question. It's an interesting comparison. Japan in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and China today. There are a lot of parallels. Um, I actually, my first experience in government was as an intern in USTR under Lighthizer in, when I was at SICE in 1987. And it was, it was enormous fun. I was 22 or three or four or whatever. And I was, I was writing letters to the Japanese foreign minister on behalf of Ambassador Clayton Yider and Lighthizer saying the, the alliance was at, at risk because of um, Japan's unwillingness to open the garbage disposal market. And I'm not making that up. And uh, Ambassador Lighthizer wrote great work. And it was before the WTO. It's when we had things like Super 301. Um, and um, 
so I, you know, part of what we're seeing today is we're back to the 80s. I think Ambassador Lighthouse is having a ball. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like it's the 1980s and we're all, we all have big hair and we're listening to eight tracks and there's no WTO and there are no production networks in Asia. Um, it's, it's, it's like Japan in, in, that, in that sense. It's like Japan uh, because you have a group of people who've come in recognizing there's a challenge, because Japan was a problem economically. Non-tariff barriers were serious uh, and so forth. Um, but people came in to the Clinton administration um, uh, in 1993 uh, uh, with a theory of Japan's economy. And, um, uh, and they were going to outdo the Japanese. They were going to create industrial policy and trade policy. And they thought they had broken the code. And they actually invited very few real Japan experts <laughs> into the process. Um, and it's similar today because you have this trade strategy towards China, and it's a lot of people, many of whom are not experts on the Chinese economy, um, and, it's, and it's very aggressive, and it's very unilateral. And the Japan approach in the early 90s completely failed. Um, uh, we negotiated the so-called uh, framework agreement on economics. The US side basically surrendered. We gave up on all our demands. We, we went into the WTO process and moved on. Um, part of the reason we failed was because the U.S. had a unilateral approach to the Japanese economy. We had no support from the EU or Canada or anyone else. And it's similar today because the approach to China right now is very unilateral. We are fighting with the EU. We're fighting with NAFTA. We're fighting with Korea over Chorus. We're fighting with Japan over bilateral FTA. We're fighting with everybody at the same time. And so I, I guess what I'm saying is I think the parallel, the, the similarity to Ch Japan in the, in the late 80s, early 90s is our approach is too simplistic, it's too unilateral, um, it's going to fail. And we're going to reboot, and we're going to have a China economic policy that involves more cooperation with Japan and Korea. Hopefully Europe uh, will have to do that. Um, there are huge differences, though. Um, Japan got out of this mess, um, as did Korea in a way, with direct investment in the U.S. Um, Lighthizer and USTR beating up on Japan was in part to get voluntary export restraints, and the Japanese got around that with huge investment in the U.S., creating manufacturing jobs. Japan is now the largest creator of manufacturing jobs of any overseas country. Korea's just behind them. And that created a huge goodwill, huge goodwill. It's hard for me to see China creating a lot of manufacturing jobs. I, don't, I think we're too much concerned about intellectual property theft. Um, and the other big difference, of course, is Japan was an ally, and China is not. And the Chinese competition with us is across many domains, not just trade, to include serious military, cyber, and other problems. So it'll be harder to get out of this uh, friction with China. But I do expect, based on the Japan experience, I do think this administration's trade policy towards China is going to look different in a year. Because what they're doing now is, hey, did a little right up the middle, uh, fighting a, a bilateral tariff war with the Chinese with no flanks without Europe, without Japan, without Canada, and NAFTA. And that's, that's not going to work. OK. Uh, yes, Dr. Han, final question. Final question. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great book, Mike. Um, explain the title uh, for us, because I think you opened by saying that uh, US just doesn't have a political system that's fit for to come up with any kind of grand strategy that the, the whole concept is actually something pretty alien to a system like, I mean, the whole purpose of the separation of powers was to prevent anybody doing the kind of grand strategies, I guess, Napoleon and, and others, maybe Xi Jinping and others do. So, but then your title indicates that it's by more than providence, so that's, a lot of it is providence, but that there's actually something else that, that actually the U.S. has done well, and so, what, yeah, what's the, was it Mark Twain's line, I think? God loves drunks and Americans. And <laughs> I mean, we, we, there's a lot of luck in the history of our growth as a power, to be sure. Um, when Europeans looked at American strategy, um, uh, they were generally dismissive de, de, de Tocqueville after traveling around the U.S., um, writing on democracy, um, actually commented at the time when Europe was um, uh, creating the concert of Europe in a very sophisticated grand strategy to prevent eruption of war. Um, at that time, he wrote that democracies, like this new republic, the United States, democracies are incapable of strategy. Can't keep a secret, 
too many divisions, too impatient. Um, Bismarck later wrote the United States, uh, in a, I'm summarizing, but he said the U.S. doesn't need strategy because God has given them special providence, two oceans and then Canada and Mexico for neighbors. And it's the title, of, I don't know if Walter Mus Russell Mead is here, it's, it's, it's in the title of his fantastic book on the global history of American foreign policy debates. Um, and um, so when I say by more than providence, the argument is no, two oceans did not give us this sort of inherited luck. We didn't just inherit a strong position in Asia because we lucked out in 1898 or we lucked out in 1945. There was forethought, there were strategic debates, it was inefficient, uh, there were mistakes, but um, from Thomas Jefferson on, um, there were people who were influential in how we approached this region and, um, and it was not just providence, it was forethought and strategy, which de Tocqueville, Bismarck, others didn't think us capable of. My hope is, I'm proselytizing now, because my hope is um, uh, that people will be dumb enough to do what I did and to write similar strategic histories, especially on Europe and the Middle East. Uh, because I, I think the biggest challenge to the liberal international order, um, and Tom Wright at Brookings makes this argument in his very good book, is, is, is from revisionist powers, and others in this conference have made that point. And they're all quite different, Russia, Iran, uh, China, North Korea, they're all quite different. But the answer to these revisionist powers has to be much smarter regional strategies in each of these regions than we've had. And it has to integrate trade, security, values, <laughs> diplomacy. And um, you can understand that very clearly when you study the history and evolution of our position in Asia. And I'm sure, Dan, it's true in Europe, and I suspect it's true in the Middle East. And um, my hope is I'm, I'm working on Ken Pollock to do this on the Middle East. I don't know who you'd recommend for Europe, but I'm hoping this becomes a thing and people start studying the evolution and history of our strategic positions in these key regions because that'll be one very, you know, it's not gonna allow us to predict the right course, but it will be an important guidepost as we think through how to approach these hegemonic uh, aspirants in each of these regions who are challenging the larger order that we all, that we all care about. Just quick follow-up. Mm -hmm. You said that the room for uh, failure, I guess, or maneuver is, is shrinking. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. system doesn't seem to be improving <laughs> in terms of grand strategizing. So how do you go, go about proposing that? So how do we then, how do you, you know, minimize or reduce the, the room, for, room for mistakes or reduce? So so the, the previous hegemons that we've kept from dominating this region were Britain, which didn't have enough power to actually dominate the Pacific. Um, they were a headache for us, but of course we also were free riders. Uh, Japan, which you know at the beginning of World War II had less than 5% of global GDP, much larger navy than we had, um, but only 5% of GDP. The Soviets, which had limited reach into the maritime domain. Um, um, and now China, which has a much larger share of global GDP, is developing much more sophisticated um, and technologically advanced power projection capabilities um, and rising much faster <laughs> than uh, these other uh, cases we faced. Um, there are some things, though, that are to our advantage that were not true earlier. Um, these other hegemonic powers that challenged us um, were, were filling the vacuum created by the collapse of the Qing Empire. And today, Asia is filled with proud, competitive nation states like Korea and Indonesia. And the nation state is our friend. <laughs> and we're on the right side of history, as the Chinese would say, because we're now the country in this region that stands for, uh, we'll be obnoxious on trade and human rights, we'll never give that up, but we're now the country that stands for middle powers, aspiring powers, uh, being able to make their own choices without coercion by a hegemon, in this case, China. Um, and so the nation state is a huge advantage. Um, we didn't have alliances. We could have, we could have in this earlier period, but we have alliances now, very powerful and effective alliances. So we have a lot of advantages. Our economy is still quite a draw. Um, but the reason we have less margin for error is simply because of the, the, the velocity of Chinese power and growth and um, the speed with which Xi Jinping has turned that um, capability into more ambition. Um, and so things like TPP, leaving TPP, I think we have a few years to figure that out, but we don't have the kind of luxury of time we've had in the past um, because just the nature of Chinese power. Okay, that actually has brought us to the conclusion of this session. But before concluding, I'd like to recognize a couple yes. of people. Actually, without their help, it was almost impossible to do, produce these kinds of things.
those are the ones who actually do the translation. I like to recognize uh, Dr. Chang Hyuk and also Ms. Kwon Na Hae, who do, do does a wonderful job of translation. Please give them a warm applause. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, that actually concludes the session. Thank you. Thank you, Chegan. Oh, on the other issue, one final thing, actually, we have prepared something for you oh. to recognize your hard work and also looking for the second volume of this book, but not sick like this. <laughs> this oh, is a plaque. Oh, that's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> that looks great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chegan. Appreciate Thank it. You. Okay. Don't close your fingers. That's beautiful. Yep. Thank you.